good morning to one and all this session is handled by stephen wagner it is chaired by hs ramane professor karnataka university with pleasure i invite you to uh, this to this session thank you sir um, good morning to all of you and i welcome all of you for this uh, uh, invited talks session and today with us we are having dr stephen wagner from austria okay he grew up in the austria and then uh, he obtained a phd from graz institute of technology under the supervision of robert tichy in 2006 and then he went to the south africa and his work at telmos university from 2007 to 2019 he then joined the department of mathematics at uppsala university in sweden in the year 2020 he is interested among the wide range of topics in the discrete mathematics and particularly the enjoy enumeration then analytic and probabilistic combinatorics as well as the graph theoretical topics he has been involved in a number of mathematical initiatives such as the uh, african mathematical sciences and mathematical olympics on national and international speaker today and he is going to and welcome stephen wagner for this session sir thank you very much and a very good morning from sweden um it's uh, 7:15 here and as you can see behind me it's completely pitch dark still sun is going to rise in about an hour and a half so i wouldn't mind being in india right now but um yeah what can we do it's still a great honor and privilege to be part of this conference honoring one of the most remarkable mathematicians of the 20th century um and uh, it's wonderful to be a part of that so my talk today will be about um aspects of subtrees of trees and specifically a quantity uh called the mean subtree order um and uh, it will be a nice example of how some uh, rather old conjectures took a while to uh, get started but recently there has been a lot of progress on those so let me start by saying what i actually mean by subtrees and what i mean by mean subtree order so what all these things are so when i say subtree of a tree i'm just mean any non empty induced subgraph that is again a tree so here what i've indicated in red is a subtree of the larger black tree this particular subtree here has a total of six vertices um and uh, that will actually be relevant to us so we will count subtrees by their sizes and then look at the average size of these uh, subtrees more about that in a minute so based on this definition we can associate a polynomial with every tree which we call the subtree polynomial here the coefficient sk of t uh, is simply the number of subtrees that have exactly k vertices and Uh, this polynomial encodes in a way the family of subtrees of t and then it says exactly how many of each size there are so to give you a quick example here we have a tree with five vertices uh let's see what the subtree polynomial is well there are five single vertices each of which is its own subtree so that gives us a 5x uh the start of the polynomial and then there are four subtrees that consist of two vertices each for each edge basically we have one so 1 2 3 4 and here i've drawn them all out so that's a total of four subtrees giving us a, a term for x squared in the polynomial then we can also look how many are, there are with three vertices it's not hard to find them all there are four of them here is one here is one here is one and also here is one So there are four subtrees here with three vertices. Three with four vertices. Uh, I get them by removing one of the leaves. And finally, there is the whole tree itself, which also counts as a subtree. And it has five vertices. So that gives us the final term in the polynomial, which is x to the power five. So the coefficients in these uh, in this polynomial 
tell us exactly how many subtrees there are with each size. So the four x cubed, for instance, means there are four subtrees with three vertices each. So the simple observation is that if I plug in one here into this polynomial, then I'm simply getting the total number of all subtrees of T. And if one goes further and takes the derivative, flexi one there, divides by the total number of subtrees, then this is nothing but the mean order of a randomly chosen subtree. So imagine that among all the subtrees that I have, I just take one at random. Um, what is the average number of vertices that I'm getting? So this quantity is what I denote mu t, and it's called the mean order or mean subtree order of the tree t. And then one can also define some sort of normalized version of that. It's called the subtree density, which you get by taking this mean and dividing it by the number of vertices in the whole tree. Um, with this normalization, you always get something that's between zero and one, because clearly the mean uh, number of vertices of a uh, subtree is somewhere between 1 and n. So if you divide by n, you're getting something that's between 0 and 1. And in fact, one can say a little bit more than that it is between uh, 0 and 1. And uh, one can restrict the interval a little bit further. More about that in a moment or two. So these concepts were introduced in the early 1980s. Um, there's some papers by um, Jameson. Um, these were uh, some of the early issues of the Journal of Combinatorial Theory, um, Series B. Um, so he proved a number of rather interesting results about this mean subtree order, about the density. Uh, among them, some of the uh, some results about the minimum and maximum. So the minimum is rather explicit. The smallest possible mean subtree order that you can get for a tree with n vertices turns out to be uh, just n plus 2 over 3. And uh, you get that exactly for the path. So when you divide by n, you're getting something that's uh, always greater than a third. And you can say that the minimum density of a tree with n vertices is a third plus a little o of 1, so just something that goes to 0. So my density doesn't just lie between 0 and 1. It actually lies between a third and 1. Um, the average size of a subtree can't go too low. And at the other end, he proved that the maximum mean subtree order is actually quite close to what uh, is, is theoretically uh, conceivable. So close to the total number of vertices in the tree. So uh, you can get n minus little o of n. And therefore, dividing by n, uh, the maximum subtree density is 1 minus little of 1, meaning that as the number of vertices n goes to infinity, the maximum subtree density among trees with n vertices um, converges to 1. Um, it's not so easy, however, to say exactly what that maximum is, and uh, I will get to that later on. So it's not quite as explicit as the first theorem, where not only we can say absolutely precisely what the minimum is, but also for which it is obtained. So for the maximum, it is not quite as simple. Right. If you look at the maximum, then um, if you check the first uh, few cases, so look at it for small uh, values of n, and um, just compare all the small trees, then it looks at the beginning that the maximum is always attained by the star. So this is true for four vertices, for five vertices, six vertices, seven vertices, eight vertices, but then uh, as you get to nine vertices, it's suddenly wrong. And as you continue, the star uh, is never optimal again. So here is the example of the tree with 15 vertices uh, that has the greatest mean subtree order. So uh, if you take all trees with 15 vertices, this one has the greatest average size of subtrees. And uh, its precise value is 8.925, roughly. Uh, here is the more precise fraction. So that is quite interesting. Uh, this is not exactly what one might necessarily expect. Uh, this is not a 
a simple well-known family of trees that's behind that. So uh, it raises the question, what can we really say about the maximum and the trees that reach that maximum? Whereas the minimum is uh, completely settled. There is also a local version of the mean subtree order where you fix some set of vertices A and uh, only count those subtrees that contain all of A. And then take the average um, of the number of vertices over just those subtrees that contain A. If we take A the empty set, then of course every subtree uh, contains the empty set and you're just getting the ordinary um, mean subtree order of the tree. Um, but in general, you get something different uh, in particular, uh, relevant special cases where you fix one of the vertices and say, I only count those subtrees that contain that particular vertex, and I only take the average size over those subtrees. What Jemison proved there is a, is a very important monotonicity result, which says that if you uh, have two sets of vertices, one contained in the other, then the uh, associated mean subtree orders um, are. Uh, so, so the, the one associated with the smaller set is always less than or equal to the one associated with the greater set it contains A. And equality over here holds uh, precisely if the smallest subject containing all of A is also the smallest subject containing all of B, in which case these two are equal. So as I said earlier, a particularly important special case there is if uh, I take the local mean subtree at a vertex. So if my, my set A here in this definition is just a single vertex. Um, and since the empty set is contained in uh, any single element set, I know now that the, this local mean subtree order at any given vertex is always greater than the global mean subtree order of T. So if I just take the average over all subtrees that contain a given vertex, then that's always greater than the average over all the subtrees of T. Right, so these were some of the uh, interesting results that Jemison obtained in his uh, first paper on uh, this, the mean subtree order and the subtree density. Um, there were a number of other uh, results, but perhaps more importantly for us today is the fact that uh, he concluded his paper with six open problems. And those open problems were left open for really quite a while. I mean, it took until 2010, until the first of those six was finally solved. But since then, there has been a decent amount of progress. And uh, by now, five of those six are settled. And the sixth is uh, kind of sort of settled, but not quite. Um, there is some progress, at least, with regard to the sixth open problem. So more about that in a moment or two. Now this uh, proved really a, to be a great source of interesting uh, graph theoretical problems. And uh, I, I greatly enjoyed working on some of these open problems. So I'll talk about these problems and um, what the, the answers, what the solutions are um, and at the end, focus on the one open question that's still remaining and uh, say a little bit about why it is uh, probably difficult and uh, so why it is still open. So um, the open problems formed section seven in Jemison's paper, and they were numbered 7.1, 7 7.2, 7, up to 7.6. Incidentally, 7.1, the first one, is the one that's still open. So I'm starting with 7.2 which um, is uh, the, the, the first also that uh, was solved. So it turns out that um, nodes of degree two, so vertices of degree two, which only have two neighbors, uh, play a rather crucial role. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the minimum among all trees is attained for a path, which of course has lots of vertices of degree two. So, uh, the, the question there is, um, so what about the other end? And there it turns out that if you look at trees with a uh, high density, then those also have lots of nodes of degree two. So um, they're also rather path-like, which suggests perhaps to study trees that do not have such vertices, 
Uh, they even have a special name. They're called homo homeomorphically reducible or series reduced. There are several names for that. That's trees that have no vertices with degree two. And you get that basically by contracting every maximal path in an arbitrary tree to a single edge. What he asked was, that do, do those trees always have density greater than or equal to a half? If you look at small cases, it seems like that. So that's a, a question that he posed. And that was the first of his open problems that was to be resolved. Um, Andrew Vincent Hua Wang um, proved this in a 2010 paper. Uh, indeed, the density of every hom such homeomorphically reducible tree is between a half and three quarters. So not only did they confirm the lower bound, but also the upper bound. Then they asked, uh, well, when does it happen that we reach a half or reach three quarters or get close to those at least? And uh, that question was then later settled by um, Hazelgrave in 2014. Turns out that you get close to a half if and only if the proportion of leaves tends to one. So if um, most of your vertices in the tree are leaves. Uh, an example where this happens is, is the star. You take the sequence of stars. They are, of course, the proportion of leaves tends to one, and indeed the subtree density tends to a half. And there are many other sequences of trees conceivable here that satisfy this. Um, and the other extreme, the three quarter, is reached if and only if the proportion of leaves tends to a half, um, and the proportion of what he calls twigs, which are vertices uh, with the property that all but one of the neighbors are leaves, that proportion needs to tend to zero. An example where that happens is the sequence of combs, where you take a long path and attach one leaf at each of the vertices. So uh, we can characterize minimum and maximum quite nicely in the case of these homeomorphically reducible trees, and even say so when you reach the one end and when you reach the other. Okay, moving on to the third problem. Um, one might wonder if the, the density somehow characterizes the trees. If you look at small cases, then it seems that non-isomorphic trees always have different densities. Prompting Jim, Jimison to, to this question here. Um, can one distinguish non-isomorphic trees by their subtree densities? But sadly, the answer is no. And it's not even sufficient if you know the full subtree polynomial. So one can construct examples of two trees that are not isomorphic, but have the exact same subtree polynomial. So exactly equally many subtrees of every size from one up to n. And in fact, the proportion of such trees, so those trees that have a, a non-isomorphic mate with exactly the same subtree polynomial, um, that proportion um, tends to one. And Conversely, proportion of trees that are uniquely determined tends to zero. Uh, that's similar to um, the spectrum not characterizing trees in general. So the proportion of trees that are characterized by their spectrum also uh, tends to one, uh, tends to zero. It's a similar principle behind it. The next two uh, problems were closely related. Um, and they are about the local mean subtree order that I mentioned, where you average over subtrees that contain a fixed vertex V. So Jameson wondered whether uh, one could also prove some inequality in the other direction. So I mentioned earlier that the local subtree at a vertex, so local subtree order at a vertex, mu T V, is always greater than mu T, the global subtree order. Um, but the question was whether there is an inequality in the other direction with a factor of two included. And the, um, and, uh, the answer to that was also uh, given fairly recently. Uh, it's clear here that uh, it suffices to show this for every tree for the vertex where this here is largest. And so that motivates a second question, well, which vertices do give you the largest, the greatest mean subtree order. So in particular, uh, looking at small special cases, it would seem that this always happens at some leaf of T. Uh, so Jameson asked the question, is the largest local mean subtree order always uh, the local mean subtree order at some leaf? And that was settled uh, in a paper from four years ago. The, 
Uh, the answer to the second question is actually no. So it's not always a leaf. It can be a leaf. It can also be a vertex of degree two. And there are infinitely many examples for both cases. But one can still use this characterization of the vertices that reach the maximum to uh, prove this inequality. So the inequality is indeed true. Uh, the local mean subtree order at any vertex is at most twice the global's mean subtree order, and the constant two here is, is best possible. So you cannot replace two by a smaller constant here. There are sequences of trees where the quotient of the two really tends to two. All right, so that was uh, already four of the six. Moving on to 7.6. Um, this was motivated by uh, the fact that the path attains the minimum. And the proof that, uh, that Jemison gave, gave is actually rather involved. So this is a, uh, an innocuous statement, really, that the path has the, the lowest mean subtree order, but it's not easy to prove. It's not a trivial statement at all. So motivated by that, he asked this question. So if a tree is not a path, is there always uh, one of these operations where I take an edge and sort of move it to a different vertex, as indicated here? He called this a standard one associate. So is there always a way to, to do so, such a local change um, and make the mean subtree order smaller, unless, of course, the uh, original tree is already in path. Um, I mean, if the statement is true, then clearly the path needs to be the one with the minimum, since every other tree has another tree T prime that's better, that has lower mean subtree order. And that was confirmed very recently in a paper from last year by Lucas Moll and um, Ott Bellerman. Yes, this is indeed the case. So for every tree that's not a path, there is such a tree T prime that is obtained by a simple operation of moving an edge from one vertex to another that makes the mean subtree order smaller. Uh, proof is, again, not easy, rather technical. Um, but once you've got it, the fact that the path has a minimum mean subtree order is implied. It's automatic. So this takes us to the final, but actually the first problem. We have solved all the other five. I said there were six in total, 7.1 to 7.6. Now this is the first one. And um, it is about the maximum density. So earlier I showed you the tree with 15 vertices for which the subtree density is greatest, uh, where it attains the maximum. And uh, you had this funny shape where you had a lot of leaves at uh, two ends and two more leaves sort of attached uh, on the path that connects the two. Um, and it has the special property that is a caterpillar. If you remove all the leaves, then what is left is a path. I'll show you that tree quickly again. So here it is again. This is a, what one calls a caterpillar. If you remove all the leaves, then what is left is just a path with five vertices. And so what Jemison asked, and he even carefully phrased it as a conjecture, uh, that it might always be a caterpillar. So the pattern starts with lots of stars, but that turns out to be wrong. So the next pattern that's observed is that it always seems to be a caterpillar. And this is the only remaining problem that's still open. So do they? The answer is still not known. Um, and personally, I went back and forth on the answer to this problem. Um, for a while, I thought it would be yes. Then I thought it might be no. Then I thought it would be yes. And so right now I'm more on the, the yes side. So I think it is in fact a caterpillar, but I have no way to prove it at this point. But I can say a few things about uh, the maximum subtree density. However, it seems that the problem is uh, probably quite hard, even though it uh, sounds rather simple and innocuous. You're just taking the average size of subtrees and you're asking, well, what's the greatest possible value this can have. So how hard can that be? But the answer is probably quite hard. So there is some computational evidence. If you look at small trees up to say 40 vertices, then it's true. Uh, it's, this has been verified. And there are some partial results that I'm gonna show you uh, right now. 
that uh, come from a, a very recent preprint that also give some uh, indication that the answer might be yes. Uh, so for starters, one can prove a local version of it. If you focus on the local mean subtree order at a vertex, uh, rather than the global one, where you average over all the subtrees, then uh, you can say exactly what the maximum is and for which trees it is obtained. Namely, it's always a broom, some, so a graph like this with a path and some uh, leaves attached at one end with the vertex V, where we take the local mean subtree order at the other end. So the intuition is that the leaves here at this end uh, create lots and lots of possible combinations. So you get many subtrees that contain the whole path and then some subset of these leaves. So there are lots of them and uh, they're on average quite large. So with this construction, you get large local mean subtree order. The proof is a bit technical, some calculations involved, which I have to mostly thank my co-author Stein Camby for. Um, but at the very least, yeah, we have this local version of the Jamison question settled. Um, and the answer is it's always a tree that looks like this, a broom. And so we can tell rather precisely uh, what the maximum of the local mean subtree order is. It's n, so the number of vertices, minus the logarithm uh, and then plus something that's bounded and fluctuates a little bit. So the function f here is periodic. It's given by this formula between zero and one and then it continues periodically. Um, in their paper from last year, Moll and Ullermann also observed that one can take a double broom, which is sort of similar, you just have a long path and leaves at both ends, uh, to create uh, trees that have very large mean subtree order. And they, they actually showed that the greatest sub mean subtree order and greatest density is obtained when you have about two times the logarithm of n leaves at each end. And one can use this construction that they, they gave to show the lower bound in this theorem and the upper bound is based on, on the local version I showed you just now. So this result here restricts the maximum of the mean subtree order in a relatively small interval. So the maximum is at least this and it's at most that. And you see that the difference is, is not so big. It's this plus two here. So up to an error term that goes to zero, the difference between the lower bound and the upper bound is just two. This is decent, but of course it's not quite everything. Um, however, it turns out that these double brooms that give us the lower bound, they're not optimal for sufficiently large ends. We can do a little bit better than those. And the actual uh, structure seems complicated. Lastly, we can say a little bit about the characteristics of optimal trees. So we can say to some extent what they look like or what they have to satisfy. So we know that they have uh, very few leaves. So only logarithm n many, essentially. The number of leaves is bounded by four times the base two logarithm plus some constant. We know pretty precisely how many subtrees they need to have. So in principle, subtrees, so in principle, trees with n vertices can have anywhere between order of magnitude n squared and order of magnitude two to the n many uh, subtrees. So we can say rather precisely which of them are best for the mean subtree order. Um, the number of subtrees has to be order of magnitude n to the power four. So there are some constants such that the number of subtrees has to lie between the one constant times n to the power four and the other constant times n to the power four. Also, we can say that the diameter is very close to, to n, the total number of vertices. So they have very large diameter. They're very long, uh, almost path-like. So the error term is just a little bit above root n. So there are a few things that we can say about these trees. Um, they have very few leaves, they're very long, so they're sort of like caterpillars, but um, it's, this is not enough to show that they're actually caterpillars. And the reason why the problem seems to be hard is that uh, the structure we conjecture is a bit complicated. So this is what we think roughly the optimal trees look like. So you have about two log n here, two times base two logarithm there, and then a couple of other leaves in strategic places. One in the middle, then one at one fifth, one seventeenth, one sixty-five. So these are powers of four plus one, the numbers in the denominator. That turns out to be 
the solution to some optimization problem. So this is a rather complicated and strange shape, um, which makes it so difficult to prove anything about these trees. And also it turns out there are many trees that are sort of near optimal, that are not far away from the maximum, and many of these are not even caterpillars. So that also makes it hard to uh, solve the, the um, Jameson conjecture or the Jameson problem. Um, so it's just some future directions. Um, what can one still do there? So the obvious question is, can we go further? Can we prove the actual caterpillar conjecture? But on the other hand, there are several other problems that are actually still open, some later ones. Um, so five of the six from the first paper are, are solved, but there are some later open problems as well. For example, is it true that the subtree polynomial of a tree without vertices of degree two is unimodal, so the coefficients go up and then down, except for the first two? Uh, this is still wide open, and I have no idea whether it's true. There is also a lot of recent activities around similar parameters that are defined in terms of some sort of average. You can really take uh, your favorite uh, graph subsets and then take the average and get similar parameters to study. So there is still a lot to investigate here, a lot of very interesting, very intriguing problems. Um, and um, yeah, a lot of recent activity, as I said, after these problems being dormant for more than 25 years, there has been quite a bit of activity now recently on these questions. Yeah. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure to, to speak to you and I welcome any questions. Thank you, sir. Any questions? I just want to ask for my knowledge. Um, Thank you very much for your nice talk. You are talking about uh, you know, subtrees in a tree and then subtree polynomial. Mm -hmm. My question is if, I if we take a graph G and take its all spanning subtrees, can we have uh, any, can we go to the structure of a graph taking into account only subtree polynomials? Oh yes, in fact, uh, there has been some activity around that as well. So there have been generalizations to arbitrary graphs, not necessarily trees. Um, and uh, there have been questions um, around this type of subtree polynomials and subtrees of, of arbitrary graphs. Uh, for example, a, a very simple question that is also wide open is if you take all the subtrees of an arbitrary graph. And um, you look at how many of those are spanning. So you get a probability that a, a, a randomly chosen subtree is spanning. And it would seem that the, the graph for which this probability is greatest is the complete graph. Um, but uh, this is an open problem. So it, it seems simple, but uh, I have no idea how one would prove it. So yes, one can absolutely do that. One can define subtree polynomials uh, for arbitrary graphs. One can define all sorts of modifications with many interesting open problems around them. Thank you very much. Any other question? So I have one question. Yes, please. Uh, so, uh, density removing the any one endpoint or some uh, all endpoints from the tree, how it will impact the de density of the original tree then? So you you remove all of them at once or just one? Or one 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 endpoint. Well, I mean, so if if you remove one, the the subtree density will go down. So well, the, sorry, that's not true. The, the mean subtree order will go down. <laughs> Okay. Uh, the density will not necessarily go down. So there, okay. um, it, it can happen both ways. You can go up or down if you remove the mean. But the mean subtree order will, will necessarily decrease. That there is uh, also some monotonicity result there that already goes back to Jameson himself. So if you remove all the leaves, then of course the mean subtree order will, will go mm -hmm. down and decrease. So we have at least some monotonicity in that regard. You take the normalized version though, where you divide also by end and things are not necessarily as simple anymore because the, the denominator then changes as well. Correct, correct. Okay, okay, okay. 
thank you sir so uh, regarding this uh, polynomial of trees any other properties of those uh, polynomial you studied um well there there are some results around uh, the century polynomial so um i mentioned unimodality okay now, um we we have uh, currently no tools to prove this so i have no idea how one would approach it but there are some results in that direction as well so um, one can show that under certain conditions, for instance, the, the coefficients are asymptotically uh, Gaussian, so they, they form a, a normal distribution, basically, okay, okay, okay. Um, if the tree grows large. Okay. So I can uh, prove things that are sort of related, but mm. not completely equivalent, of course, because uh, yeah, unimodal and asymptotically normal are not exactly the same thing. So that is an aspect that has been studied. Um, and uh, the, the zeros of these polynomials have been studied also quite yeah. recently. So one can characterize quite well what the zeros of such polynomials can be. There is a, a set in the complex plane okay. uh, that um, sort of captures them. Okay. So yes, there have been uh, sort of recent studies around uh, other properties of this uh, tree polynomial. It's a very interesting field. Okay, okay. Any other questions from audience? If there is no more questions, uh, uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, I thank uh, Stephen Wagner for his nice presentation on the subtrees of trees. Thank you, sir. Thank it's you pleasure. for a nice presentation. I also thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to chair this session. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Okay, thank you, Stephen and Ramne. Okay. Uh, we'll have uh, the next invited talk at 12.45. The talk by Mathias Schacht is cancelled. Uh, and uh, the only talk is that of Venkatesh Raman from 12.45 to 13.15. Okay, okay. IT 10, only IT 10 will be held. IT 9 is cancelled. So will, will it be in this se se session or in this track or the other? The other Wait. one, even number track. Even number, right? Yeah. IT 10. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.